working on orangutans for the last 18 years. Um, tell us how dire is the situation on the ground and what are the main reasons for the disappearance of orangutans and the, the habitats of rainforests? Um, originally, the, the main problem was um, logging, both legal and illegal logging, which over the past few decades has really taken its toll on the remaining habitat of orangutans in Sumatra and Kalimantan. But more recently, in, in the past decade or so, it's reached a crisis point in which the forest area, the habitat of the orangutan, is um, not only being logged, but it's being logged with the purpose of converting to agriculture. Population growth, both locally in these islands as well as um, internationally, a, a demand for this product, palm oil, um, great uh, rate of development, especially in Central Kalimantan and Indonesia, of oil palm has meant a rapid decline in, in the habitat area of the animal and therefore their demise. When the oil palm company comes in and they clear the, the forest in which their rain tent inhabits, not only the orangutan, but some 80 to 100 percent of other mammal, reptile, and, and um, bird species will perish in that conversion of forest to monoculture. And the orangutan is one of the most visual, um, iconic species that we've seen affected by this. Not only do they come into conflict with humans because they're seen as agricultural pests, they go in and they, they um, rip open the young palms to get at the young ones inner shoots, young shoots, for some small nourishment because their forest uh, bounty has, has been decimated and thereby destroying these trees from ever growing to produce oil palm. So they're seen as an agricultural pest. In fact, many companies uh, up until recently, and still some do recent, recently, put a bounty on the heads of orangutans. They actually pay their workers money to show the head of an orangutan that might have been encroaching into the plantation. Um, and this started really showing its head, this, this kind of human-wildlife conflict affecting orangutans in around 2003-2004 when many, many of these orangutans were, were being rescued by local NGOs um, and brought into sanctuaries. Many times they were too late. The rescue workers would hear of an orangutan in trouble in an area of, of palm oil, go out there, and by the time the orangutan was found, perhaps the local workers had taken it upon themselves to immobilize the animal and they've done this through brute force. Uh, they've beaten it unconscious or to death, butchered it with machetes. Uh, the rescue workers even found a rain dance doused with petrol, alive and set light. One of the uh, densest areas uh, of rainforest was being cleared? That's right. Uh, these problems continue. Uh, just in the past few weeks, an area of protected forest, Tripa Peat Swamp Forest, in the, looser, um, in the looser ecosystem uh, area of Sumatra. The so-called green governor that had embraced REDD and, and um, you know, the, the protection of forest in his region, Governor Bache actually illegally gave a permit to a palm oil company to clear in this looser ecosystem. This company has further complicated matters by breaking the law to use burning to clear this land. Burning is illegal under Indonesian law, and the, but this company has set many, many fires and hundreds of orangutans are perishing. This particular forest has the densest population of orangutans anywhere and it has a very significant and important population in, in this specific area, Tree Papit Swamp. And so the local population looks set to be extinct in a very short time, unless there's intervention. Now how do you really uh, begin to see what is uh, ethical palm oil or sustainable palm oil? Is there such a thing as sustainable palm oil? Uh, it's a very difficult question. I, I believe we have to consider degrees of sustainability, because any time you talk about monoculture, there's, there's an element of that's not very sustainable. It's not natural because it's a monoculture. Not much biodiversity can exist in that. But if these monocultures are developed in, in highly degraded areas, wastelands, where the resident biodiversity is minimal anyway, the impact will be less. So one of the first uh, objectives of sustainable palm oil is to not clear primary forest, to not clear secondary forest that has high conservation value 
and there's, there's various definitions of what can entail the various markers of high conservation value. As an RSPO member, you're committed to identifying these areas, making measures to manage and uh, you know, protect those areas, and certainly to not do any development on those areas. So getting the palm oil companies to commit to the principles and criteria of the RSPO should preclude destruction of orangutan habitat by those companies. The presence of a single orangutan in a patch of forest denotes it as a high, high conservation forest, so it should not be touched. So, and that's just one of many criteria. There's social elements, there's the use of, of chemicals and, and um, pesticides, etc. There's uh, water use and, human rights issues and workers' rights, all of these things come into play. And of course, they're all very, very important. Um, so as a company progresses towards sustainability, we should see fewer and fewer of these impacts on those kinds of things, on, on communities and on the environment. As a participant in the RSPO process, which is a multi-stakeholder one, uh, how much needs to be done to get to that stage where you can say comfortably that the ideals of um, the RSPO are reached? I think some of the challenges have to do with the credibility of the RSPO right now. The public perception of RSPO is it's not 100% water type. That perhaps there are companies that have received cert certification and then were later to found um, contravening that PNC, perhaps they're under investigation or have put under investigation to resolve those problems, but there have erupted various issues post certification um, that, that you know jeopardizes the credibility. Part of the recognized problem is is the certification bodies, the third party uh, bodies that, that undertake the certification process and the reliability of these these certification bodies, if they're doing a sound job, if they're truly looking at everything that needs to be looked at um, before ticking the boxes. Uh, so, so more um, emphasis on, on making certain that, that those are reputable organizations doing that. Um, also this year, <clears throat> the principles and criteria of the RSPO are under review um, to, to look at revision, perhaps to make them stronger. I think if we fail in this revision to have uh, principles and criteria that address the issue of greenhouse gases, then RSPO, in effect, really, really couldn't be considered sustainable. Perhaps it's on the roads to sustainability, but certification, in, in the real sense of the word sustainability, if it doesn't address greenhouse gases, it's, it's not really meeting its, its uh, obligations. And also, the issue of peat, development on peat, needs to be worked out, and, um, and really a moratorium on any development on peat is, is required. The peat is especially important. It's not very productive in the first place for palm oil. It's, it's going to give you a lower yield, but more importantly, they're, they're historic, huge carbon stores. They've, they've stored carbon for millennia. And when you drain this peat to develop, it emits an enormous toxic cloud of greenhouse gases, in addition to, to removing all the trees, which would have sequestered that much carbon as well. Peat burns very easily. If that catches fire, your emissions go up that much. Um, so emissions from degradation of peat is a serious issue in, in, in the issue of climate change. We must do what we can to protect that. And then again, that ties in with the greenhouse gas emissions element of the principles and criteria of the RSPO. And the RSPO is only going to achieve these things with, with a very intelligent, participatory engagement from all the stakeholders. Uh, to not have RSPO be seen as an industry-led initiative, voluntary only. Yes, it's voluntary, but we would hope that the people that are coming forward to make this thing progress, NGOs, private sector, scientists, um, are coming together with the same goal of making sustainable palm oil the norm, to make it business as usual, and to have that definition of sustainability have some teeth to it.
So the RSPO is only going to be as good as, as what the participants put into it. And that's why I stay in the RSPO. That's why I sit on these working groups and try to challenge and, and push the bar up. And I think we need more engagement of that type rather than just maybe blanketly condemning RSPO as not good enough, so we just give it up. Right now, it's virtually the only game in town. It's only going to be as good as we make it. Well, in Singapore, uh, the, the reminder that the rainforests of Indonesia burning come every summer when we experience the smog. And the general impression is it's the small-scale farmers who are behind this. How, how can you dispel this? Um, we, we can dispel this. This, this is, um, I'm sorry, it's propaganda from Indonesian palm oil uh, industry, I believe, that's making that myth come out. If you consider that, yes, burn and slash agriculture has been part of the, the, the culture of small scale farmers in Indonesia for generations. But how long have you been having these smoke problems? Not for generations. The small-scale farmers know how to control their slash and burn. They know how to contain it into their plots, to the areas that they want burnt, so that they can do some replanting. Um, the burning that we see is just too immense and too wide-scale, and through satellite imagery, we can pinpoint that most of them are happening in new developments of oil palm. And if the oil palm company wants to say someone else set fire to it, and always pointing the finger, it, it just doesn't wash. So yes, there are a number of, of oil palm companies that use this as a very quick and easy and cheap way of clearing the debris uh, to, to prepare for planting. Again, this is counter to the principles and, and criteria of the RSPO, no burning in, in the RSPO, and it's counter to Indonesian law, but breaking that law does not seem to be up, upheld. Um, at any kind of prosecution for this, as we've seen in the Tree Peets uh, Swamp case. As a consumer, how do we approach this issue? Is boycotting palm oil the solution? How do we do we read labels better? I mean, do we look look out for some kind of sustainable labels? Obviously, you know the the quick reaction. You say palm oil is is causing these fires and haze and destruction of forest and displacement of orangutans. Um, yes, business as usual, that is true. So you want to say, I don't want any product with palm oil in it because I don't want to contribute to that. And and that's, you know, that's notable and that's, you know, uh, commendable if you want to make a personal choice of your own to, to avoid that as, as a vegetarian would avoid meat. Um, it, it's a statement, it's a principle. As far as a campaign objective as an NGO. It's not something I would endorse. I would not go and say, please everyone boycott palm oil because it will not have the benefit that you, you might think it will. Reading labels for looking out for palm oil. First of all, in many countries, the palm oil is simply listed as vegetable oil. It does not indicate which kind. There's some changes happening, especially, uh, for example, in the EU. Um, soon the labeling of any vegetable has to be specified whether it's soya, palm, rapeseed. Um, so that will give people an opportunity to see which one they're consuming. But it could also come under any other, you know, any number of other names and derivatives that, you know, it's just too hard to be reading every label, memorizing, looking for these, these things. Your weekly shop would end up being eight hours long. Um, Boycotting palm oil simply won't make a difference on the ground. The, the biggest buyers of, of oil palm are China and India, which, I'm sorry, but the consumer demand for sustainable palm oil or no palm oil in the products are... And most of this is loose oil, isn't it? It's, it's not even branded. Yeah, it's not branded. And, and actually, I mean, you're talking about India, and this is the cooking oil that's on offer. And you know, most of India living below the poverty line, you're going to say, oh, please pay more and get the, you know, the alternative to palm oil. I mean, I know in Indonesia, to buy olive oil costs a fortune, you know. No, you're going to buy palm oil. So, so because it's so ubiquitous, it's, it's a staple in many, many households 
households who maybe don't have the wherewithal to make choices. Uh, I, th I just think it's, it's not practical. It's, it's completely impractical. Um, even if the few people that are, are so motivated to boycott palm oil, all got together and boycotted palm oil, it wouldn't make a dent in what's being sold in, in China. Um, I think it's more important that as consumers, we communicate to the manufacturers and retailers that, that we like to buy from, that we insist on the commitment to 100% certified sustainable palm oil, palm oil that can be traced to its source, demand that the companies know where their palm oil comes from, demand that they know that their palm oil is not causing deforestation, it's not killing orangutans, and then we can be satisfied with buying these products from these companies. As far as on-product labeling of sustainable palm oil, I'm not aware of any companies that are actually printing this on their product yet. They may well, in the next, you know, in the short future, start to print that. But there's the whole challenge of communicating yet another green label. You know, fair trade and soil association. We've got so many labels that we have to look out for in understanding what each of them mean, whether we trust them, whether, you know, one negates the other, one is, repeats the other. That's unfortunate because obviously if there was something clear on the, the product that told you you were getting a safe product, that would make things much easier for us as consumers. You have mentioned that uh, there is power in petitions and social media campaigns. Uh, this is something that we can get involved. Can you give an example? Yeah, I can give two examples that, that really resonate. The first was about two years ago. Um, Greenpeace put together a viral video campaign out of the UK with Nestle Kit Kat bars, which showed very graphically that Kit Kats were made with the blood of orangutans, essentially, that they were buying their palm oil from a company that was clearing orangutan habitat. And it, it really went viral. It went all around the world, and there were people going on to the Nestle Facebook page going, writing all kinds of, you horrible, horrible, horrible things, what's wrong with you? Um, and the Nestle PR department did a terrible job mitigating this onslaught. The short answer to all that is within a short while, being so publicly condemned by Greenpeace and its followers and the, and the world at large, that Nestle severed its contract with that producer and encouraged that producer to make right where they'd gone wrong if they ever expected to, to get that contract back again. And Nestle UK made strong commitments towards sourcing only sustainable palm oil. And both that producer that came under fire as well as Nestle UK have made amongst the most significant steps in moving towards not only RSPO certifications, in fact, gone beyond the requirements of the RSPO and adopted a complete no deforestation policy in the oil palm that they produce. Another more recent case is in the case of this palm oil company that is clearing Tripa peat swamp in Sumatra, which is a protected ecosystem. Two elements come to mind. The first element is that it was illegal for the Governor of Aceh to grant this concession, it's a counter to, to Indonesian law. Secondly, the concession owners, PT Kalista, are breaking the law, Indonesian law, by burning the, their um, acquisition. And through social networking and media alerts and press internationally, this story came to light. An online petition a number of our online petitions were uh, sent around, uh, resulting in more than a quarter of a million signatures, and those were sent directly to people like the President of Indonesia. As of last week, the President has now initiated an investigation into what's happening in, in this area, into the laws being broken, which is something that actually we didn't expect to happen. So yes, one minute, 30 seconds signing a petition can really make a difference. And finally, uh, what gives you hope for the orangutans? 
what gives me hope? Um, I've, I've been working, when I started working with orangutans, it was about working with the young orphan orangutans and trying to nurse them back to health. I made a lot of personal connections with individual orangutans and come to know them as in, you know, individuals, as unique characters worthy of a safe and healthy and abundant life in the forest. And I've worked very hard towards that end. I've seen these orangutans that I've known since babies grow up and rehabilitate in, in the project that, that I frequently visit and learn all the skills they want. And the concentrated effort of many parties, private sector, NGOs, donors, supporters, have now made possible that for the first time these orangutans I've spent over 10 years going through the rehabilitation process are going to be released into safe forest this year. It's everything we've been working for. And and to pick up these victims, give them a future, put them back in the forest, and not only for their welfare, but by creating a, a, a new and viable population in this forest and protecting that forest indefinitely. There are solutions and they, they are not completely impossible to achieve. And, and I think that uh, success really resonates with me. And on the other end, when I see, <clears throat> for example, a palm oil company that has made a commitment towards sustainability, that up until 2007, the project was rescuing a dozen orangutans a month from their plantations. As of 2007, when they made their commitment towards sustainable palm oil, not a single other orangutan needed to be rescued because they had ceased to clear their habitat. And this was a major company having a major impact on the local population that just took it upon themselves, made the decision to do the right thing. So I, I would hope that we can get some momentum and make that kind of behavior not a niche behavior, not just one company doing the right thing. I want it to be business as usual. Thank you very much, Michelle. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.